Ladies and gentlemen, Shane Mahoney, our keynote speaker, has emerged as one of today's most influential and dynamic thought leaders in hunting and conservation, not just here in North America, but on an international scale. Deeply passionate, highly insightful, and often challenging in his views, he is one of those rare individuals who can reach deeply into our thoughts on hunting and somehow help us to better understand why we feel as we do and why our conservation mission is so important. Shane is also rare in that his views are respected across the entire spectrum of the conservation world in both the scientific and professional wildlife communities as well as by NGOs and the hunting and non-hunting public. He is everywhere recognized as a tireless worker on behalf of wildlife and a vocal proponent of sustainable use as a conservation practice. While many of us has read his essays, heard a lecture or two, know of his scientific publications, viewed his films, or sought his advice on predator-prey systems or caribou behavior, most of us know him from his, only from one perspective, and few of us can know or appreciate the full range of his engagement with the hunting and conservation world. Having been employed by the government of New Zealand, or Newfoundland and Labrador for over 30 years, Mahoney is no stranger to public service or the challenges of managing wildlife on the ground. Holding honors and master's degree in science, he has served in a, a variety of leadership roles, including chief of wildlife research for that province, and more recently as executive director of sustainable development and strategic science. In 2001, he founded and subsequently led the Institute for Biodiversity, Ecosystem Science, and Sustainability, an organization for that for the past 14 years funded graduate student research at numerous universities, universities in North America and Europe. He has garnered much recognition in, for his conservation work, receiving awards and accreditation within the hunting and academic circles alike. He was awarded the Gold Medal in Wildlife Science by the Caesar Kleberg Institute, was named International Conservationist of the Year by Safari Club International, was listed as one of North America's 25 most influential conservationists by Outdoor Canada magazine, and was nominated for Person of the Year by Outdoor Life. Shane has written more than 100 popular articles which have been featured in more than a dozen print magazines and his work appears regularly in such well-read publications as Sports of Field, North American Hunter, and Our Own Wild Sheep. Shane has appeared as a host or narrator for a variety of radio and television of efforts, including the World of Sports of Field, Leopold's Big Game Profiles, and Boone and Crockett Country. He currently serves as president and founder of Conservation Visions and is vice chair of the Sustainable Use and Livelihoods, we call that SULI, Specialist Group for the United Nations World Conservation Union, IUCN. Wild Sheep Foundation is a very significant sponsor and contributor to those efforts. He also serves as the international liaison for the Wildlife Society and is an expert to the International Council for Game and Wildlife Conservation. Shane is a life member of the Wild Sheep Foundation, Dallas Safari Club, Safari Club International, and Pheasants and Quail Forever. Shane is a friend of the conservation world and without a doubt is the spokesman that we need. Ladies and gentlemen, my very good friend from Newfoundland, life member Shane Mahoney. Well, first of all, um, I'd like to say that it is a privilege to be with you this evening. We've come here as hunters, ladies and gentlemen, to celebrate something more than just a good evening. We've come here to be part once more of the tapestry that has built the great success for wildlife in North America and around the world. A success that is only known to a relatively small few in this United States of America and in Canada, known to too few the world over. For while all of us may take a certain pleasure in seeing wildlife and in pursuing it in whatever way we wish, 
There are too few people who are engaged in the conservation of these extraordinary creatures, and too few who know the story of the success of the hunter-led conservation movement in your country and in Canada and around the world. And I would like to ask the people in the audience this evening, all of you, why is it that so few people know this history? Why is it that it is so easy for people to criticize the hunter and the hunter's world? We have a 150-year tradition in the United States and Canada of rebuilding wildlife populations and of doing so against incredible odds. These achievements for conservation are not sideshows to be dismissed as something that happened accidentally. The abundance of wildlife that occurs in the United States today and the abundance of wildlife in Canada and in many other parts of the world is the result of work. It is the result of dedication. It is the result of people believing that part of their role as citizens was to conserve those extraordinary life forms that we witnessed on the film that opened this evening's gala. But despite the fact despite the fact that millions of people participate in this hunting world, some 25 to 30 million in Canada and the United States alone, despite the achievements that we have made, despite the fact of the enormous amounts of money that this activity generates, the more than one half million jobs that are created in this country and another several hundred thousand in Canada, still it seems possible for people to dismiss what we do to dismiss what we do here this evening, to dismiss what we do afield as something that is not worthwhile. We may have brought wildlife back, ladies and gentlemen, but do you know what our problem is? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. So here we are one and a half decades into a new century, and anybody who knows what's happening in the hunting world realizes that we are under extraordinary challenge. In Africa, in Asia in particular, in Europe as well, and it is coming home to roost. Anyone who understands this movement knows that the greatest challenges are not behind us, the greatest challenges lie before us. And once more, every single one of you, and everyone like you in every organization like this, every person who knows the slide of that bolt coming back, every person who knows what it is to come over that rise and see that animal for the first time, Every one of you who knows what it is like to break out at the beginning of a day in darkness and wonder what spectacles will lie before, it falls to every single person who has ever experienced that to now stand and meet the challenges that are coming our way. This is not a fight that ends with some silver bullet. It is an ongoing, unending, honorable, noble struggle. And we are either part of it or we are outside it. So what does this leadership that we require now look like? First of all, let us set aside two myths one that we have allowed to grow in the public mind, which is that wildlife exists by accident. There is not a creature that flies, that swims or crawls over high mountain crags, that will exist on this planet by accident anymore. 
those great species will survive because of what we as people do. There is no accidental wildlife abundance, ladies and gentlemen. It is time that as hunters, we set out to destroy that myth, break it down to powder, and scatter it in the four winds. The second myth is our own, and that myth looks like this. It says that if we continue to do what we have always done, only do it a little better, then all will be fine. But have you not noticed? It is a new world. Do your young children not see things differently? Are there not new problems that we did not even imagine? Who would have thought of ISIS or Al-Qaeda or the innocents that have died the world over because of their vitriol and bitterness? Our leadership in the hunting world cannot be the same as before. The public is demanding more. Our government agencies are demanding more. The international organizations that have the capacity to shut hunting down are demanding more. And the one thing that they are demanding from hunters and from the organizations that represent us is that we stop talking the talk and we start walking the walk with respect to conservation. It is not enough for us to gather a few catchphrases, to use a few terms, to interject the word conservation here and there in a conversation. That day is over, thankfully. We need leadership with vision, ladies and gentlemen, not just courage and commitment. Remember, a courageous and committed man can forge all his life to create a path to nowhere. Vision is what will make the difference. Vision is what got Teddy Roosevelt to his feet. Vision is what started us down this road. Vision is what people who led the hunting movement have had in times of crisis. The notion that we can circle the wagons. You hear it all the time. It's our right. We circle the wagons and we fire from within. And we'll keep it then, by God. It's whistling in the dark. Only if we prove the relevance of what we do in a modern world will we get to keep it. Only if we prove the relevance of hunting will we stand rightfully to inherit the legacy of Theodore Roosevelt, Aldo Leopold, George Bird Grinnell, Ding Darling, and all the others who forged the path before us. It is a mistake, a huge mistake, for the hunting movement to focus on the extreme animal rights movement and the anti-hunting movements alone. This is a fatal mistake, and we are making it all the time. We must realize that the world is changing, society is changing, and we must explain why the willful taking of the life of an incredible animal remains relevant in this world. And can we do it? Yes, we can. And I will tell you why we can do it. It is not because of the jobs we create. It is not because of the money we spend. The reason we can do this is because we alone in society have that one special ingredient that I will call tragic wisdom. This is the wisdom that comes to a man or woman who has taken the life of a wild creature. It is that complicated feeling of achievement mixed 
with an emotion that wonders and remembers the great beast as it was. It is that moment when suddenly we realize that there is no life without death and that the entire world is one world of which humanity and wildlife are a part. We cannot expect the average person in society who has never experienced this to understand intuitively what I say. But each of you, each of you has this tragic wisdom. It is not to be made little of. It is not to become part of some killing spree machine or the people who advertise that as hunting. It is to become something that convinces the average person in society that this man or woman has tread somewhere that I have not yet gone. And because of that, they have a view of life and of the world that I cannot yet have, but that I can respect. All of us know that this business of hunting is no simple thing. We all know that from the time we learn it first and until that time when we can do it no more, it is something completely outside the bounds of everything else we do. And we also know that throughout the history of this activity, in all parts of the world, it has been those who have followed the hunt, who have tracked the wild beast, who have journeyed to the places where he lives, and who have successfully taken those animals that in the end become the most important spokesman for the conservation not only of the animals themselves, but of the places in which they live. This has always been the case, and it must remain so. For those who would deny these truths, for those who in the hunting world say, I am afraid of being too green. I am afraid of speaking about these things. Well, let me tell you, the greatest hunters who ever lived, and I put Theodore Roosevelt in that category, but also Silu, and also O'Connor, and a host of others, not one of them were afraid to speak such things. Not one of them was afraid to say how much they admired and loved, loved the animals they pursued. Not one of them was afraid to say, and when I saw the eyes glaze over and the last great heaving sigh flatten his chest for the last time, that I felt something. It is time for our hunting movement to grow up and to start to realize that these animals are not targets. They are everything else but targets. That their conservation is what must drive us, what we must speak about, what we must talk about, what we must engage in discussion over. And that every time we represent this tradition of hunting, we must make sure that people understand when they come into a room like this, that we are not talking the talk, but we are walking the walk. For the young hunters that are out there, do not make the mistake of believing that you cannot express love for these wild animals at the same time that you can express a love of hunting. Hunting made us human, ladies and gentlemen. And speaking now for wildlife will keep us human 
in a world that is rapidly becoming less and less human all the time. I want to thank Gray Thornton and his board and this organization. Not for having me here. I want to thank them for creating something that's called a conservation night. Because there ought not to be a small child, girl or boy, who first is taught how to handle a rifle or a shotgun or a bow. There ought not to be a single moment passed from the first time that a father or mother begins to extend this tradition to their children before the word conservation is used. All animals die, ladies and gentlemen, just like us. Animal death is a constant an absolutely essential part of the natural world, the predator and the prey, we become part of that unending cycle only one way. And that is through our deliberate attempts to hunt and kill creatures. If we take no more from that act than the glory of having done so, if we take no more from that act but bragging rights among some circle of friends, if we take no more from that act than another check on our list, then I believe that animal has died in vain. We need leadership in the hunting world that is going to inspire not just hunters, but is going to inspire the broad public of our countries. I wish to see a time when, when the public speaks about a hunter, they speak about an individual whom they believe is at the head of the movement to conserve wild places and wild creatures. We must broaden our reach and our embrace, ladies and gentlemen. We must speak for places and creatures that we may never hunt. We must keep wildlife with us. And we must teach those who will follow us in the hunting tradition that we stand at the pinnacle of principle when we work to conserve the wild creatures that we pursue. Teddy Roosevelt told us, and he might as well be in this room speaking to each and every one of you directly here this evening. He had hunted everywhere, and he had loved the birds, the songbirds, every bit as much as the big game animals he pursued. And he said, they cannot speak for themselves, so we will speak for them. I believe this is exactly what the Wild Sheep Foundation is doing. Go further in this regard. Travel harder on this road and take the leadership position that will be the only one that will conserve hunting in the 21st century, conservation. Thank you all very much.